Dr. Ilya Bindeman. We're excited to have Dr. Bindeman present, present for us today. Dr. Bindeman's interest in volcanology started for him at a very young age. He was an under, as an undergraduate student at the Moscow State University, he was involved in several publications. He followed with a graduate, with a graduate work at the, at a top you know, Russian geochemical laboratory, oh, sorry, Chernogol, Chernogolovka, near Moscow. He completed his PhD at the University of Chicago as a volcanologist studying melt evolution and the evolution uh, and, and element partitioning in magma changer, chambers throughout using elemental and isotope geochemistry. He completed his PhD. Since completing his PhD, he's worked as a postdoc and a staff scientist at the University of Wisconsin and Caltech, and he's held his position as a professor at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Oregon since 2004. As Dr. Ben Bendeman's research interests evolved, he became a world leader for implementing oxygen isotope studies in the Precambrian. His recent work has provided major contribution to our understanding of triple oxygen isotopes in, the pre in Precambrian shales and found the world's lowest delta-18 oxygen values on record, coeval with the global glaciations at 2.4 billion. Both of these we're going to be hearing about a bit today. Dr. Vindeman and his lab are studying uh, are also studying ancient climate conditions through deuterium, hydrogen, and oxygen isotope compositions of volcanic ash and glass. They also have a history of work on the Yellowstone hotspot track centers, Iceland, and Kamchatka, studying the origin of large volumes of silicic magmas and using isotope microanalytical tools and numerical modeling. And without further introduction, I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Bindeman. Yeah, thank you very much for introduction. Um, can you see it well? Yeah, we see it. Great. Okay. So my talk today will uh, um, be on triple oxygen isotopes in evolving continental crust, granites and plastic sediments, but I will briefly touch on the world lowest um, uh, values which we measured in Karelia. I will start with um, uh, saying that whatever I present today is uh, uh, was recently presented uh, at a workshop at Mineralogical Society of America in the form of the chapter. So you are welcome to um, examine this um, <clears throat> volume, and I will draw some figures uh, from this uh, from this volume. Uh, I've been asked to give you a broad introduction because not all of you are isotope geochemists. Why do we care about triple oxygen isotopes? I'll just um, uh, introduce several slides which are famous and uh, important for all students to know. When I was at the University of Chicago, Bob Clayton, uh, our professor at that time, uh, was already 20 years uh, after his major discovery of his life. So uh, in early 70s, uh, Larry Grossman brought him a bunch of meteorites and uh, they wanted to check uh, the hot accretion of the solar system, assuming that everything will be homogeneous. And then as soon as Bob Clayton measured triple oxygen isotopes, uh, which was only a few labs were doing, uh, um, measuring it at that time. So he discovered the major, uh, major ranges in the calcium aluminum inclusions and then chondrites, which uh, on these diagrams, delta 17 O versus delta 18 O, belong to the line with a slope of one. While everything on earth, uh, due to mass dependent fractionation, has a slope of 0.5. So 0.5 is because uh, variations in oxygen 17 is about half that of oxygen 18 due to mass difference. Okay, so this discovery, Bob Clayton originally proposed that it's a result of the supernova explosion and uh, which supplied uh, light oxygen 16 into the protoplanetary nebula. And this is essentially a mixing line. Okay, so, but uh, uh, regardless of interpretation, so this diagram became uh, the key to classify um, uh, different planetary bodies and meteorites uh, in, uh, in this space, for example, Mars, is 0.3 per mil uh, heavier than, uh, than Earth in the Moon system, and the Vesta is lighter. So sometimes I get uh, calls um, from meteorite collectors to determine whether it's from Mars or from Vesta. Okay, so as I said, that uh, now the work has been done to classify all the meteorite in the space, and this is a recent review by Trevor Ireland and others. Uh, Earth, for example, is proposed to be uh, forming from instatite chondrites. 
but the mystery persisted. Um, is it supernova origin? In this case, we should expect similar elemental anomalies and other elements. But then this, uh, uh, many elements uh, have been tried and none have been discovered, except very few, mostly in oxygen and sulfur. Uh, Mark Timmons was a postdoc with Bob, Bob Clayton in 1983, and he sparked oxygen cylinder and observed very strong 17 ohm and uh, 16 ohm enrichment in ozone. So here is his paper from um, uh, 1983. And uh, again, here you get uh, ozone, which is produced uh, by sp uh, sp sparkling by photochemical reactions. It turns out to be very heavy uh, with respect to oxygen and the residual oxygen is very light. And they all belong to the slope um, of one, to the line with the slope of one. Everything in this world is now classified um, in the atmospheric species and atmospheric gases has been classified on this diagram as well. Okay, so according to uh, Mark Timmons uh, and his point of view likely uh, uh, prevailed in science uh, that the uh, variations which we observe in the solar system are due to photochemical effects um, affecting oxygen and sulfur in, uh, uh, in the protoplanetary uh, disk. Okay, but then uh, um, I'll just skip quickly here. There's a nice paper by uh, Jim Lyons and um, Ed Young in 1995 explaining uh, how opaque uh, the protoplanetary disk should be to permit uh, UV light to penetrate far enough. And then there should be some mixing and cooling so to preserve these anomalies. Um, so photochemical effects and uh, uh, large excesses in oxygen-17 persist uh, today, and especially they persisted in the Archean before the Great Oxidation event. So before the advent of atmospheric oxygen, UV radiations bombarded the surface, producing mass-independent effects of sulfur and mass-independent effect of oxygen. Uh, but even in the modern world, you observe a rather significant excess uh, of oxygen-17. Uh, and uh, this parameter measured from the terrestrial fractionation line, which I'll be using it today, called big cap 17. Okay, so stratospheric ozone and uh, tropospheric ozone, they have excesses of anywhere from 30 to 100. And residual oxygen is uh, depleted by 0 0.2, 0 0.3 per mil. Okay, and uh, uh, there's a, a plethora of reactions which you can uh, do. Um, and uh, uh, Jim Lyons in, the, in, the, in this volume, which I recommended, uh, produced quite a bit of re, uh, reactive modeling uh, of different components, what should be the mass independent signature. Okay, so the signature, significant variations, uh, deviations from the terrestrial fractionation line is called mass independent behavior or mass uh, independent fractionation. Um, an attempt was made in uh, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and uh, still continues today to recognize uh, mass independent signatures in uh, terrestrial archives. In particular, uh, Hui Ming Bao uh, probably uh, discovered very light oxygen isotopic value uh, of marine sulfate uh, during uh, the Neoproterozoic snowball or glaciation. And there is a paper by Crawford et al. about uh, uh, 1 1.4, 1.5 billion year old rocks, also sulfate, which goes to negative 0.9 per mil. So uh, explanation for that, again, through modeling is uh, when you have uh, don't have much uh, oxygen, uh, you can invoke CO2 as a carrier of a uh, big signal, and then uh, it somehow propagates into the sulfate reservoir forming gypsum, which inherits um, this uh, uh, mass independent signature uh, derived by photochemical reactions, uh, by modeled photochemical reactions in the atmosphere. In the modern world, um, uh, we have suggested that uh, when you have a super volcanic eruptions, the volcanic plumes can penetrate into the uh, ozone layer uh, between uh, 30 and um, 100 kilometers in the atmosphere, in, in the stratosphere. Uh, this picture is a shuttle photograph after the Pinatubo eruptions showing formation of sulfur aerosols. Okay, so the sulfur needs to get oxidized and uh, um, in the upper atmosphere, oxidation goes through OH uh, uh, liquid phase reaction, and then that inherits, inherits some of the ozone. In particular, next to you guys, next to UC Riverside, when you drive to um, Death Valley, uh, my postdoc, former postdoc Ervan Martin, who is now in Paris, 
we investigated uh, three supervolcanic ash layers uh, from Yellowstone and from Bishop Tuff. And we observed that uh, in these ash layers, you, uh, you, you still preserve anywhere from 7 to 15% of the original mass independent sulfate, which uh, re represented the acid rain. Uh, so you can leach out this uh, sulfate and then determine that uh, it's much higher than the neighboring uh, sediments of this uh, now dry lake. Okay, but my talk today, and I'm moving fast enough, is about mass-dependent triple oxygen isotopes, which became science maybe five, six years ago. So, uh, and this, uh, foot, uh, uh, this figure is from uh, Sharp and Westbrook chapter. Uh, emphasizing that um, uh, when you plot 17O in linearized coordinates, just uh, be, bear with me, it's just uh, the same thing as a normal, except it's expressed a little different. Um, and then you, uh, you are trying to recognize tiny variations in these uh, ranges, you will use BCAP 17 prime parameter, which is shown here. Essentially what it does, it's uh, it tells you that uh, the slopes of the fractionation lines, which was not known before, is a function of temperature. So we are trying to use the mass-dependent variations of oxygen-17, what uh, used to be called just terrestrial fractionation line with arbitrary slopes. We're trying to uh, determine the deviation from the uh, highest possible slope, 0 0.5305 to the likely the lowest possible slope, uh, 0.516, and then these tiny variations, which are measuring 0 0.2, 0 0.3 per mil, uh, will be in, uh, measuring them and interpreting them. So that started with when Pak and Hervars observed this relationship. An advantage of this approach is that uh, it's kind of very similar to clumped isotopes. We have the same um, isotopic system, uh, oxygen, 70, oxygen system, and two isotopes. So it, it means we have uh, two fractionation equations for oxygen 18 and for oxygen 17. And therefore, we have an extra equation which helps us to resolve isotopic value of meteoric water and temperature. Normally in isotope geochemistry, when something grows from water, you always make an assumption what was the original temperature, what was the original uh, meteoric water value. Okay, here we can solve for it. Okay. Um, these two chapters is from, um, uh, these two figures are from chapters by Mosbrook and Sharp and Schaubel and Young. Um, this is the experimental calibration for calcite quartz fractionation. You can see that the total range for quartz is 0.2 per mil. Um, and then uh, this is the theoretical co computation for different minerals. And I'll be talking today about the meteoric water cycle. And uh, just to remind you that uh, when a cloud travels inland, uh, it experiences isotopic distillation. So the rain falling behind the mountain ranges or in, inside of the continents, large continents would be isotopically depleted with respect to oxygen and hydrogen isotopes. And when you plot one versus the other, you get a meteoric water line, which they teach you in isotope geochemistry. Uh, the same relationship um, persists in the 17 oxygen isotopes. Since the work of uh, Luz and Barkan in 2005-2010, uh, uh, there have been many measurements of um, uh, triple oxygen isotopes in meteoric waters and uh, uh, surface materials. And the meteoric water line is uh, expressed like that, 0 0.5 to 8, and, uh, and with a slope of uh, negative 0 0.033 or uh, whereabouts. This is called uh, an uh, excess of 17 oxygen uh, in uh, um, here in the expression per mic, just multiplied by 1000. Um, uh, and that's very similar to the deuterium uh, excess in the, in the meteoric water line for deuterium isotopes. So we'll be using uh, the meteoric water line uh, from Luz and Barkan. The advantage of using uh, the meteoric water line for 17 oxygen is because uh, if you were to use um, deuterium, deuterium does not preserve itself very well. Uh, in the geologic record. But uh, if you measure oxygen, um, you can recognize the same effects. Okay, and just again to remind you that oxygen isotopes span about 100 per mil on the surface of the earth, uh, everything negative. Um, our seawater is assumed to be zero per mil, that's our standard. 
anything negative is uh, occupied by meteoric water and uh, everything positive is occupied by rocks. In particular, sedimentary rocks which grow from um, uh, seawater at, um, uh, and meteoric waters at low temperature, they have large isotopic fractionations and they are high delta 18 uh, contain uh, high concentration of oxygen 18 and also oxygen 17. Uh, the rocks which uh, underwent um, hydrothermal alteration, they exchange oxygen with um, meteoric waters and therefore they uh, extend into this range. Okay. And we'll uh, consider several important episodes uh, in Earth's history. So this diagram is from Grant Young, telling you on the supercontinent cycle, advent of oxygen, um, drawdown of CO2, uh, and um, uh, seven episodes of pan-global glaciation, known as snowball or slush bowl Earth. Okay, so the uh, great oxidation event, when you do field work in Russia, uh, you observe some rocks are gray and other rocks are very red. And all you need to do is just to travel from uh, one place to another place, and you find this uh, mud cracks uh, of red color, and then uh, uh, else, elsewhere you find uh, uh, thinly laminated lake sediments with some drop, uh, drop stones, in, indicative of uh, uh, glaciation, with the Paleoproterozoic glaciations. So the, uh, uh, in the next five or seven minutes, I'll talk about the evidence of this um, Paleoproterozoic uh, glaciation, which we found in um, uh, rocks in Karelia in Russia which go to uh, the world record minus 27.3 per mil in delta 18 ohm. And they also have very low hydrogen isotopes. So they record glacial meltwater rock interaction during uh, at least two snowball earth episodes. So uh, they were discovered because mineral collectors <clears throat> got interested in uh, uh, using oxygen isotopes for fingerprinting. <clears throat> and they published a paper on um, uh, some unusual values uh, in uh, mineralogical journals. That attracted our attention and we went to this uh, locality to which normally is visited by students uh, and undergraduate students uh, doing, uh, doing field work uh, in Karelia. Uh, so uh, that's almost a gem quality corundum, but it's <clears throat> not quite the gem quality, but also beautiful kyanite. So these are formerly hydrothermally altered rocks. Just think of kaolinite, biomite, uh, aluminum rich assemblages which got metamorphosed to amphibolite faces, uh, preserving oxygen isotopic value of the protolith uh, and preserving this record, uh, preserving this oxygen isotopic values and geologic record. So we investigated every possible corundum and kyanite bearing locality. And I need to mention that they normally follow, uh, they are found in the Belamorian belt in Northwestern Russia. Um, which uh, uh, is inside of the continent, so it's uh, surrounded by the um, a nice complex. So that was a continent with some rifting, which happened 2.4 and then later um, 2.2 and 2.1 billion years ago. So you can see that these localities with the lowest oxygen extend uh, now 500 kilometers across the belt, suggesting that it's a regional phenomenon. So it's likely a continental ice sheet was covering this area during episodes of mafic magmatism and later metamorphism. So when you do the geologic mapping and isotopic mapping, uh, walk across the terrain and collect samples, and then uh, this map has maybe 200 analysis of oxygen isotopes, you can put this um, isopack, if you wish, maps uh, <clears throat> which tells you there is a bullseye pattern. So this core, which is 100 meters by 200 uh, by 50 meters is minus 27 per mil. And uh, around it, you get uh, minus 20 per mil. And notice this green area is an intrusion, which is now sheared in the meta metamorphic episode. But basically originally that was a, uh, an intrusion, uh, which caused uh, isotopic modification uh, in a classic scare guard type meteoric hydrothermal system described much by Hugh Taylor, for example, at Caltech. Uh, and, but because the values are so low, uh, the only possible uh, way to get uh, uh, oxygen isotopes, even in water, 
uh, less than 22 per mil, it's, it's, uh, this is ice. Uh, anything low, less than 20, 22 must be ice. So 27 is definitely ice. Okay. So we uh, measured these uh, depletions in intrusions, which date 2.4 billion and 2.1, 2.3 billion. They happen to be compositionally very different. So these are a uh, one global um, episode of mafic magmatism, um, a global superplume with high, high magnesium basalts. And these are more local rifting with uh, uh, thaleitic high iron dikes. Okay, we found um, uh, uh, depletions in both. And we dated um, these rocks by uh, in, in situ method and also by ID teams method at the University of Geneva, where I spent my sabbatical. So we obtained uh, some good ages uh, for both. And then also we uh, decided to expand um, this 500 kilometers discovery into different parts of the world, which were proposed to be um, a single continent 2.4 billion years ago. So the work, you can continue this work uh, if you want. So. Uh, we kind of run out of uh, grant money. So, uh, but uh, Scurry Dykes in Scotland are the same age and uh, they were proposed to be uh, joined with um, Karelia. So you can do Karelia, uh, you need to find these rocks here. Here we go. So, but now is it snowball or slash ball earth? Glaciation. So the snowball earth is when uh, the whole world is completely frozen and there is no hydrologic cycle. In the slush ball earth, you, you still maintain some liquid, uh, some water, which is capable of uh, evaporating and um, uh, distillation in the, during meteoric water transport. So we kind of thought about it. Uh, Paul Hoffman was saying that slush ball was impossible, but then uh, um, Dorian Abbott at the University of Chicago came and he um, did through uh, modeling uh, that there is, a, there is a climate called uh, German Gant, which means that um, the equators maintain ice-free um, surface and this ice uh, water interface migrates from southern to northern hemisphere, but still it's possible to uh, generate uh, water by evaporation and then distill it. Um, uh, we modeled this with uh, Jun Yun uh, uh, Lee at, the, at Brown University. She runs uh, the model for aqua planet. So all you need to do is just to create this condition and then run isotope enabled uh, global circulation model. That's what she did and she obtained the temperature distribution and delta T known precipitation distribution. And uh, the conclusion is that you need to be uh, a little bit away from the equator, but the gradient is very, very steep. So if you are at 30 degrees, you already can generate minus 40 per mil uh, delta T no value of water. Um, and paleomag uh, evidence for the paleoproterozoic uh, continents is such that the majority of continents were located next to the equator or around the, uh, around the equator. So we must have uh, a snowball or glaciation rather than, rather than a polar excursion of Karelia or Scotland. So that's, uh, I, I believe, uh, from, uh, I know from David Evans, that's pretty well established. Uh, that was the subject of his nature paper in 1997. Okay. Uh, you can ask the question, okay, so we found minus 40 per mil uh, meteoric water or minus 27 per mil recorded in, in rocks. So, but maybe the ocean water was isotopically depleted. I mean, that's a very contentious topic and uh, I will address it uh, next. Uh, but I will first uh, tell you that we also investigated <clears throat> the uh, Veterinary Belt, which is located next to Belamorian Belt. So Belamorian Belt is a continent, and the Veterinary Belt is mostly an ocean basin, which was closed. Uh, it's, it's also 2.4, 2.45 billion year old, uh, and it's ex exceptionally well preserved. It has uh, sections of oceanic crust, which goes from um, upper mantle to the pillow basalts, and uh, various intrusions. I'll just show you how it looks in the field. So these are beautiful pillows, uh, pillow basalts, uh, 2.4 billion years, and some of them even preserve uh, volcanic glass, which was investigated by Electromica Pro. So this is also the great locality to investigate secondary alteration because uh, there are um, well-preserved quartz epidote uh, calcite veins. So this uh, particular area is quarried 
for granite countertops. So there are beautiful cuts through these pillows. Okay, so what we did is we investigated oxygen isotope with um, uh, a graduate student, David Zakharov, who is now a postdoc at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, so we investigated stable isotopes here, including triple oxygen isotopes. So Pilamorian built, veterinary built. And um, we plotted oxygen uh, 17 versus oxygen 18. And uh, so these are the coordinates which I'll be using. Uh, so it's a complex diagram. Just notice that most data points are <clears throat> located somewhere not very far from zero. And if you draw fractionation lines and uh, do some mixing calculations, you will arrive to conclusions that uh, the reconstructed water would plot somewhere between minus one and minus three per mil delta etino, meaning that um, the seawater alteration uh, by the uh, which generated this quartz on epidote um, it, uh, it resulted from uh, seawater, which uh, uh, which is not very different than modern uh, seawater. So that was our starting. Uh, Condition. So we start with approximately minus one per mil uh, seawater and we'll do evaporation to generate this uh, highly negative um, glacial uh, melt water, I mean, glacial, uh, glacial ice. All right, so that's, uh, I'm exactly at the midpoint of my um, talk. So Next, I'll uh, switch gears a little bit. In the part two, I'll talk about shales through time. Um, so this is the picture uh, after publications of our paper uh, using, uh, which used triple oxygen isotopes and shales through time. The Russian newspaper presented this uh, funny picture that this appearance of land over water. Um, and then uh, squatting our names here. So it tells, it tells us that the, as predicted by the Bible, um, it's exactly halfway through Earth's history. Okay, so what I'll do next, um, I will be using weathering products such as um, shales uh, to tell about the isotopic value of meteoric water. So we just used hydrothermally altered rocks to tell about the meteoric uh, water values. Now I'll be using sedimentary rocks to, uh, to talk about the same basically processes and we'll, but we'll talk about weathering and surface conditions. So the rest of the talk will uh, discuss triple oxygen isotopes and weathering, uh, describe some principles. Uh, then we'll talk about clays and modern river basins. But then I'll talk about diagenesis. Uh, does diagenesis change triple oxygen isotopes uh, when you move from clays to shale. Well, we, after that, I'll present uh, data for shales through time. Opportunistically, I'll present uh, data for granites through time. <clears throat> Apparently, they follow shales record very well. We'll talk about um, temperature in the Archean and the uh, isotopic value of uh, Precambrian or Archean seawater. We um, do the measurements in the University of Oregon Stable Isotope Lab. Here's a few shots of the lab. For conventional analysis, we use this plug. We can, we can do um, 30 analysis a day. We have TCAA, gas bench, but most of our work is um, laser fluorination. In order to achieve the most precision for triple oxygen isotopes, we built a special um, bypass to the existing laser fluorination line which involves um, uh, four traps and the gas chromatography. So I can see that here is our schematics. Uh, this is needed uh, to purify oxygen gas, which we generate uh, by fluorination uh, to achieve the best precision, uh, in particular to get rid of the contaminants. Um, to, so our chemistry uh, would be as good as the mass spectrometry. And uh, because clays are reactive, we cannot uh, use the regular plug, we need to uh, have an airlock chamber and we for uh, reactive materials for shales we use uh, we design this <coughs> rotating mechanism uh, to introducing sample one by one okay um, 
so how does it work in terms of resolving? I told you that uh, triple oxygen isotopes gives you an extra equation. And here we go. We can use, for example, coarse water fractionation uh, for 18 ohm and 17 ohm from Sharp. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see that the polynomial equation for oxygen 18, uh, polynomial equation for oxygen 17, and we make an assumption that uh, parental waters are connected through a meteoric water line, uh, which we do from Luz and Barkhan. Uh, and then, so th th uh, we have, um, we can measure oxygen 18 in your sample, oxygen 17 in your sample, and we have three unknowns and three equations. We, we don't know water, 18 and 17, and we don't know the temperature, but we have three equations. So we are able to solve these equations. Um, we can recast them in the form of uh, the bulk shale. Uh, and uh, then um, we can solve for water and, uh, and temperature and the form uh, uh, we, uh, one statement here that we cannot just simply algebraically solve it. We need to do it numerically because there's a rather complicated algebraic form. So we do it by numerical uh, equation of this uh, equation and obtain roots which we uh, match with uh, observations. So perhaps the easiest way is to graphically illustrate this. If, they, if I plot oxygen 17 versus oxygen 18, uh, if I have a reaction or um, like something is crystallizing from meteoric water with a value of minus 15, it will belong to this line in this space, right? And temperature goes like that. At low temperature, you get greater fractionations of both isotopes. So at one degree, your sample is going to be high, high delta 18 you know, And at uh, high temperature, your sample is going to be low delta 18 you know. Okay. But if I change water now to minus 5 per mil parental water, I move in this space. So I'm able to resolve in this space uh, both temperature, which goes this way, and value of meteoric water, which goes that way. Uh, additionally, I can also resolve whether the sample is from meteoric water or from seawater, uh, because um, uh, when you solve this equation, it will give you a solution, or it does not give you a solution, requiring you to change uh, parameters. So, for example, here, the computed solution, uh, parental water minus 15 per mil, and temperature is 9 degrees, and that's in a good agreement. So for this sample, which happened to be our newly developed uh, triple oxygen isotopic standard, uh, it's a flint from England. Um, so it has a 35 degrees Celsius formation, which is reasonable, and uh, uh, water of negative 0.7 per mil, which is uh, exactly what you would predict. But first we want to see if the modern weathering um, obeys the rules. Uh, of this triple oxygen isotopic fractionation. And we published this with uh, Germain Bayon and, um, and Ephremer, uh, a French researcher. So he, has, he had a collection of uh, clays from major world rivers, 44 different individual watersheds, uh, tapping different geological contexts, large rivers, mixed bedrock, sedimentary, volcanic bedrock. So we wanted to measure the isotopic value of clays and see if the clays would follow uh, these equations above. And we will be targeting bulk clays. Uh, so the world rivers on average has this composition of clays. Okay. For example, for Mississippi River Basin, we get the average watershed water precipitation minus seven per mil and average temperature like that. We want to see if we can invert this and observe the uh, value. So uh, we know the isotopic value of precipitation. Um, uh, we therefore can compute um, the isotopic fractionation between clays and water. You can see that uh, with quite scatter, but still they are mostly up, uh, uh, adhere to isotopic fractionations for 18 ohm and for 17 ohm. Okay, the parameter which I'm plotting here is also water in clay. It's uh, some ty type other type of measurements which we do. We extract water from clays, uh, and that's an yet another independent parameter. Uh, it also follows some, some kind of fractionation laws offset from bulk clays. But when we plot them versus mean annual temperature of the watersheds, we basically observe no trend uh, across the uh, wide range of middle uh, <coughs> mean annual temperature of the world. When we go to tropical environments, to polar environments, we have approximately the same value of clays. 
right? So why is that? So the uh, weathering VP stands for weathering product. Uh, you possibly would uh, ask me, how do I correct for detrital contribution clays? We can do it by uh, uh, using the compositional parameters. One of them is chemical index of alteration. You can see we can apply um, the compositional um, co correction for this uh, measured isotopic value of oxygen and we get uh, in, uh, pretty much overlapping values. Uh, this comes at maybe at no surprise because as we know with increasing temperature isotopic fractionation between clay or everything for that matter and, and water decreases, right? And, uh, but at the same time, uh, isotopic value of meteoric water becomes heavier when you move to tropical um, environments. So you can see that these two lines have opposite slopes. And when you compute the bulk clay values, you observe this, okay? So that looks like it's a bad news for paleo or modern climatology. But of course, people who study uh, paleoclimatology or paleoaltimetry they um, would use uh, maybe monomineralic clay and they will use uh, a single watershed or uh, some kind of local geological context. But at the same time, maybe this is a good news because it's a direct test for global climate. So we can maybe even have a look at the seawater delta in the value via meteoric water. So if uh, this is the global state of affairs in the modern world, can we apply this to uh, the uh, shales which formed in distant geologic past? Uh, summary is that we observe no difference with bedrock types. Clays mostly reflect meteoric water values. So the clays are mostly made of water from rain. Uh, so it's a value of the hydrosphere. So there's almost no change uh, mean annual temperature and one can compute global fluxes. Uh, and that's what we did in this paper. Okay, now I'll talk about shales. And I'm about 15 minutes. Uh, 10, 12 minutes um, to the end. So uh, we talk about shales. So here's the definition of shales from Wikipedia, for example. Shales are good because they are fine grained and they have low hydrologic permeability unlike sandstones. So sandstone, you cannot trust as the values because they can be inside of artesian basins and the water will be exchanged. But for shales, uh, once you form um, um, the fine grain shale structure, it will be preserved. If it's not preserved, you should be able to recognize recrystallization because the first thing will happen is reduction of surface energy in appearance of coarse crystals, if, if there's any recrystallization. But what about diagenesis? So we move from loose sediments to a shale, right? It's called a smic to elite transition. Um, in 1970s, there was quite a bit of effort uh, in, this, in this direction. In particular, land at the University of Texas, they investigated with his students, uh, investigated deep Texas drill core, which goes to all the way to 5.5 kilometers. So you can in investigate uh, what happens to uh, relatively the same lithology, which samples uh, North American plains, basically for, for millions of years. Uh, so Mississippi River mud, for example, plots here in the delta T no value. So when you go to high temperature, as high as 200 degrees, you expel some water, something which you, what you would expect in diagenesis to happen, and you undergo from transition from smectite to illite, which happened uh, at approximately this depth. You can see that this clay is here mostly complete smectite, and then after that, a complete illite. So, uh, and the, we measured oxygen 18, that was also measured by others. <clears throat> and we also measured oxygen 17. We observed no trend with depth. And oxygen 18 shows some predictable change and uh, mostly it, it can be explained by expulsion of um, poor waters, which is, um, uh, is getting lost via permeable sandstone layers. So there's a little bit of potassium metasomatism there, but not much. And potassium metasomatism is explained by breakdown of potassium feldspar. Okay, so diagenesis is okay. So we, it does not change the bulk oxygen, triple oxygen isotopic value of the sediment. So what about metamorphism? Well, uh, we can take this big figure from Buchholz and Spencer. Uh, they used it for a different purpose. 
to understand uh, the origin of strongly pyroluminous granites and say that strongly pyroluminous granites and also metamorphic rocks which host them uh, are basically identical to the protolith. So they are sampling the uh, uh, like some kind of shale which got metamorphosed. So I'm using the same diagram to tell that not only uh, the shale itself, which is the sedimentary rock, but even the metamorphic rock, and then even if you melt it 100%, uh, do like anatexis on this granite, they will preserve oxygen, which is ultimately derived from meteoric waters. Okay, if you can determine the age of the proteins, um, then the oxygen, which is um, contained within this rock, or all these three rock types, would be related to weathering, uh, something which we normally don't think about, but why not? So uh, last two points of my talk is uh, shales through time and global climates. Uh, I will make a statement that shales form basically the same way throughout the geologic history. <clears throat> and bulk shale preserve weathering signatures quite well. It's an archive for past climates. So here I compiled um, three sedimentary archives. Um, carbonates, chords, and shales. So the shales is mostly our effort uh, with uh, using uh, various collections, including many samples provided by Andre Becker uh, at the University of UC Riverside. Uh, the chords and carbonates have been known uh, for a long time to exhibit a rather significant change in delta H and O. So with uh, age, they become lighter. And uh, two alternative interpretations to these trends is either you get a higher temperature in the Archean, and this is the estimate, you need to have 110 degree higher temperature to, to explain this range, or you need to have an uh, isotopic value of water, seawater, from which the chords and carbonates are precipitating, uh, to, uh, to be something like 15 per mil lighter. So uh, the later, uh, later conclusion is uh, almost forbidden based on what we know about uh, the plate tectonics operation. So, Holland and all, um, and uh, Mullenbach at all argued uh, very strongly that it's impossible to change the big value of seawater by much. Otherwise, you would need to change the rates of plate tectonics something like 100 times uh, and the rates of weathering by 1,000 times, etc. So, the record for shales is, has a different structure. Uh, you can see that till lights are a little bit lighter in delta H and O, and we explain this by interaction with glacial meltwater predominantly. But then uh, uh, it's also ex experiences <clears throat> in increased with time. So that's what questions we will try to answer. Is uh, the delta you know, of seawater changed or is it hotter in the past? We will use triple oxygen isotopes and an extra equation uh, which provided to us to ask, ask this question. First, I will start with this uh, basic diagram and thinking um, in the, where things should be. So if this is the mantle, here's your seawater today. The corresponding meteoric water line would be, according to Luz and Barkan, uh, in these coordinates be here, basically, with some offset, 70 no excess. So what happens if the isotopic value of seawater is a lower delta 80 no? I mean, almost certainly uh, that would result in uh, moving away from the mantle uh, through the seawater toward the higher 17 oxygen value. So for example, if your seawater is a uh, minus 15 per mil, that would be required, then meteoric wood would be, meteoric water would be much higher in 17 O. And we should be able to measure this, okay? We should be able to measure the excess of 17 O preserved in, uh, in products. So the products are connected by fractionation lines. I already explained this. So if this water, if this sample originates from a meteoric water in the modern world at minus eight per mil, uh, it will uh, plot here. But if uh, the meteoric water were much lighter in, uh, in delta eighteen O and therefore much heavier with respect to 17 O, one would draw the line through here and then obtain uh, also a match, but temperature would be much lower, okay? So if the sample is uh, for modern world gives you 75 degrees Celsius in the minus 15 per mil ocean, that will give you plus one per mil, sorry, one, one degree Celsius. So the, uh, 
paper which we published in Nature in 2018 uh, was a basic analysis for triple oxygen isotopes of shales through time. Um, and uh, what we observed uh, in this paper is that Archean shales shown in green or, or early Proterozoic shales <clears throat> um, shown by blue, syndlacial shales, they occupy this portion of the diagram. So they have much narrower range in uh, delta 18 or and also delta 17 or in higher range compared to the modern shales. When we plot uh, modern river sediments uh, on the, from a paper which I uh, just recently discussed, it's a busy diagram, but just point, uh, uh, see that the Archean shales, they again occupy very narrow range in this field compared to say modern river sediments. Um, and there are several attempts to draw, uh, uh, like, to draw different fractionation lines using uh, various temperatures. When we plot this uh, big cup 17 parameter through time, uh, we observe the major change in the uh, 17-0 uh, uh, happening at about uh, 2.4 to 2.2 billion years ago. So we explain this by uh, changing the hydrologic cycle. So in the Archean world, uh, we get um, a much narrower range of 17 noids because meteoric waters, which were available for weathering, were also much narrower in the delta 18 and delta 17 values because continents were much smaller. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and uh, starting from about 2.1 billion, we get a hydrologic cycle and the range uh, of uh, delta 18 and delta 17 values similar to a modern world. So here's what we proposed that uh, in, um, in the Archean, we get small continents and uh, uh, think of modern tropical islands. Uh, and this weathering products would record as topic value of tropical waters. Uh, while in the modern world, we get the whole uh, variety of environments including snow, um, large continents where you get uh, isotopic distillation, uh, etc. So that this transition happened during the formation of the first supercontinent uh, Kenner land uh, at about 2.4 billion years ago. And we interpreted this as the evidence of emergence of land. So the Archean uh, uh, crust was uh, also available and the continental crust um, was uh, uh, available in quantities not that different than say uh, early Proterozoic, uh, but uh, the state of the crust was different. It was in the Archean, it was mostly submerged. Uh, some crust was emerged, of course, we get sedimentary rocks, but post uh, uh, 2.2 uh, billion or 2.4 billion, uh, we get large swaths of land. Um, and um, we also speculated that, of course, it will increase weathering reactions, uh, draw down, cause drawdown of CO2, change albedo of the earth, cause snowball or glaciation, etc. So the Archean and uh, meteoric water values are uh, reasonable. Uh, notice that at new uh, Paleoproterozoic glaciation, we get low delta you know, value of water, which is uh, consistent with. Um, uh, hydrologic cycle operating on, on the earth covered by ice. What if we assume uh, the delta 18 value of seawater of minus five per mil? Then suddenly life uh, a lot easier. And this is within a permissible range or maybe on the extent of permissible range of uh, meteoric water values or seawater values. So we uh, notice the scale go from four to two billion years now. And again, for new uh, paleoproterozoic glaciation, we obtain a lower temperature and low delta is no value of meteoric water. But uh, for the Archean time, we get temperature, which is uh, similar to what I just showed you, uh, 40 degrees to uh, 30 degrees, um, 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's our conclusion that seawater is uh, from minus one to uh, minus five per mil. And uh, <clears throat> paleo temperature somewhere in the realistic range. Uh, I have two slides left. So I said that we also opportunistically measured, uh, presented a large data set for quartz in caival granites through time. And the quartz are shown um, by blue points here for delta 18 and delta 17 Notice that for granites also exhibit rather significant step function change in the big cup 17 parameter, which is um, what we observe for shales. So we interpreted uh, this that uh, uh, granites uh, and we targeted pre 
mostly uh, granites formed in the uh, of orogenic nature, so formed in subduction zones or the ones which have high delta in the value to start with, so we would avoid interplate volcanics, for example. So, of course, granites will follow, follow on the same line. If you remember my original statements that uh, high temperature processes gives you high exponent, low temperature processes give you lower exponent. And uh, uh, so this uh, 0.5523, uh, uh, if granites are following 0.523, it tells us that the granites went through weathering. So everything in this uh, in this world is derived from weathering and recycling of rocks. So we define this so-called crustal array. Okay, so my conclusions, uh, I presented this data for clays in modern river basins, shales. Uh, I told you that Archean seawater could be a little light, but not necessarily minus 15. You don't need to do that. And we observe uh, major jumps of uh, 17 oxygen and shales and granites at 2.4 to 2.2 billion. All right, so thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ilya, that was really good. It looks like you already have some interest. Um, uh, I've, got, I've gotten some uh, questions sent to me privately, one from Itai Halaby. Um, both the negative 40 per mil ice inferred uh, from the hydrothermally altered rocks and the near modern seawater delta 18 oxygen inferred from the altered pillow basalts require an assumption about the temperature of alteration. What temperatures were assumed? Uh, temperature of alteration, uh, it's a quartz epidote uh, assemblage. So temperature is pretty well constrained, including fluid inclusion studies like 250 to 350 degrees. Okay, Itai, if you haven't wanted to step in, feel free to unmute yourself, but if that was good, then thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, that's fine. Oh. No, uh, we, uh, we just used 200, uh, I mean, that's a, a mineral assemblage with fluid inclusions. It's um, in the paper, Zakharov et al. Uh, we measured um, fluid inclusions within quartz and uh, it's uh, just quartz epidote assemblage itself. We compare it to modern hydrothermal system 504B or DDP core and it's identical, so. Um, un understood, but that's for the hydrothermally altered rocks. Is that also the case for the for the altered pillow basalts that you showed? Oh, pillow basalt. I see. You're saying asthma. Pillow basalts also have uh, uh, similar. I mean, they are next to each other, so not not very far. So it would be a lower portion of pillow basalts and uh, upper portion of. Uh, it's actually a lower portion of pillow basalts, I think. <clears throat> okay, and what if you relax that? Uh... Um, assumption that uh, they were also altered at 250 degrees C, the, the pillow basalts. What does that do to the uh, estimates of... Uh, uh, not much. Um, so it's, uh, it, uh, again, it's in, the, in this paper. I mean, this graph, I can come back. Okay, I'll look it up. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll look it up. Thanks. All right. Um, I think uh, Paul Hoffman also had a question. Did you want to uh, just step in, Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, well, two, two points. Um, first of all, Eichel Feucht and Dallas Abbott um, showed that the Jormungan is destabilized uh, when you introduce uh, sea ice dynamics. That's in their uh, Climate of the Past paper of 2012. So Jormungan no longer is considered to be a, a viable uh, climate state. And uh, my second uh, question, is uh, what did you, did you think of the De Vlies, uh paper in the PSL um, uh, this year, uh, which suggested that uh, with high and low temperature uh, seawater silicate uh, um, exchange, and uh, and and so what, uh, upon deglaciation, when the meteoric water is reintroduced to the ocean, uh, you would get a perturbation which would potentially be uh, quite long lived. Uh, I think somebody, maybe Huiming Bao, measured uh, the low delta HNO value in some uh, uh, cup carbonates. If I'm like some carbonates uh, go to minus 15 per mil, I think, uh, which is uh, evidence of uh, rapid deglaciation. That's what you're asking. So I mean, that's I, uh, uh, probably not a whole ocean signal because the ocean would have been highly uh, salt stratified 
uh, mm -hmm. during and uh, for uh, some tens of thousands of years after the deglaciation because of the uh, meltwater uh, introduction, uh, mm -hmm. uh, according to Jun Yong's uh, modeling, uh, that stratification could last for up to 50,000 years. So mm -hmm. the cap carbonate is probably not a measure of the uh, global seawater. Well, I mean, one can uh, build up this uh, glacial ice during the initial stages of snowball, or, um, like during the end stages. Originally, when uh, b before Jormungand, we started this work, we suggested slush bowl is, or uh, well, maybe beginning stages of snowball would build up enough glacial ice, um, and then this glacial ice would uh, somehow, I don't know, stay. Plus, there is hydrologic cycle on a completely hard bowl, a hard snowball earth, right? So there is like sublimation is, pro is possible. Uh, I think we need a, a general circulation uh, atmosphere ice sheet model. O18 dynamics in the snowball earth situation. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, snowball onset mm -hmm. is pretty fast. Um, all state, so I don't think there's much prospect for a prolonged inter slush ball intermediate mm -hmm. at that point. I think we have maybe just one more question from Itai about, uh, he says, other combinations of temperature and seawater, delta 18 uh, oxygen would likely, likely satisfy the shale triple oxygen results. Why five, negative five per mil and 35 to 45 C and not for example, 10 per, negative 10 per mil and about 15 C. Uh, so we tried, uh, I should mention that we tried uh, different combinations, but uh, you can only find uh, the good solutions in uh, between zero and five. So yeah, uh, I can explain the technical details. So um, uh, I mean, the mathematics of these lines is such that you can only find realistic solution when uh, uh, you are close to the, uh, when your route is very close to the intercept. Uh, and you get this, achieve that only between these parameters. So we're trying to, <clears throat> and we're kind of doing a strange thing. We're trying to talk about delta Sino Valley of seawater using uh, shales which produced by meteoric water derived from seawater. So it's a little bit convoluted assumption, but I should mention that advantage of shales is because we compare shales through, uh, with shales. So chertz and the carbonates are chemogenic products. Right, so you can know uh, they have been worked for a long time. They undergo alteration, etc. Uh, I'm I, I'm arguing that shales is a, is better archive uh, to understand the past compared to uh, polygenic chert and uh, carbonates. Although we need to go through this uh, equation solving, uh, our conclusions are quite robust in in terms of find almost no roots. I cannot resolve it. So I have uh, uh, um, two follow-up questions uh, related to that. How sensitive is that to the uh, temperature-dependent fractionation that you uh, infer from, um, uh, the, you know, that you showed? Um, that you know, that's not uh, the result of any uh, thermodynamic calculations or, or lab experiments, but more of an, like an empirical uh, relationship. You mean and the, the second oxygen fractionations? Yes. Um, um, and the second, the second question is regarding, you know, shales deposit in, in seawater and, you know, some mm -hmm. early work from Sam Epstein's group, um, you know, showed uh, re-equilibration uh, of some, some clays, at least, with uh, seawater once they get deposited in the seawater. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get I'd a like chance to, yeah, I didn't get the chance to talk, talk about, uh, to about this. Uh, it's a week, uh, I uh, did quite a bit of computation in the, in the chapter, uh, in the uh, Rims chapter, maybe I'll find it, yes. Basically, this figure, which uh, is, uh, explains various uh, things which happen to shales and the how, how we can resolve. Uh, so this is our resolving power with shales and we're trying to reconstruct Mississippi uh, uh, watershed area. So that's the total range of the sediment in the free of formation. And here's the computed water. So, I mean, you need to do some averaging, but basically you arrive to conclusion that uh, these processes cancel it, itself out because at about 100 degrees when there's a diagenetic transition it's almost perfect zero per mil fractionations with this system so if, if you add seawater 
in a pore space. Then uh, at 100 degrees, when you lock it into ill light, uh, you'll have almost zero permeal fractionation. That's, uh, kind of, I didn't get a chance to. Explain. No, but without, um, I mean, without any recrystallization, just exchange of water without, without changing from. Oh, there's no, uh, like clay and um, water, there's no exchange. I see, I see, thank you. Okay, well, I think we can take one more from Dr. Kent Condi. And Kent, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, I wasn't clear as to why granite should inherit the shale spectrum. Probably most granites have a mantle signature. Um, granted, there's two stages in the production of the granite. You have to get a mafic source first and then partially melt that to get the granite. But I, I just don't see why, unless they're S-type granites you're talking about exactly. when you the shales. I don't understand why granite should inherit a shale signature isotope. So some granites uh, can be S-type granites, such as the Luca granite and Himalaya. They're just produced by radioactive heating of the thickened crust. You can just completely melt uh, the crust by radioactive heating, and then you require no mantle material. In this case, it's yes, going to be good. Yes, I understand that, but most granites probably do exactly. have a mantle. And this is why this range is half that of shales. Uh, I mean, your point is well taken. So uh, in order to make a granite, you need to have a basalt melting the crust and basalt will provide some mantle signatures and uh, making this jump about exactly half compared to shales. So you will, you will, it's gonna be mixing at each time interval between uh, uh, the mantle derived magma, which is here and the shale. Thank you. All right, I think uh, that can wrap it up for today. I think it looks like people enjoyed this one. I had some issues with uh, recording, but hopefully I can get the whole the whole video online for people who missed it. So uh, keep